Good afternoon readers, it's Tilly here from Tilly Shelf and welcome to another day of the Victorian Poetry Challenge. We've got to, I think, day nine, so we're on to our ninth Victorian poet. Um, but we're not on to our ninth separate theme. So yesterday, um, we had Lizzie Siddle yesterday and we've got Lizzie Siddle again today. So if you can remember from yesterday, Lizzie Siddle, Elizabeth Siddle, was the wife of Dante Rossetti, who was our poet yesterday. And here she is um, in perhaps her most famous appearance um, as Ophelia in Sir John Everett Melias's famous painting of that image. Um, and this is a poem by um, her husband Dante Rossetti's sister, Christina Rossetti, um, which you can really feel her presence in. Um, that looks at this, at this idea of the representation of a woman in art. Um, and looks at this idea of Lizzie, not explicitly named, but a woman like Lizzie, um, who is redrawn and replicated time and again um, in one person's work of art and yeah, how that conveys them as a person. So I will go ahead and read it to you. It is called In an Artist's Studio. One face looks out from all his canvases. One self-same figure sits or walks or leans. We found her hidden just behind those screens. That mirror gave back all her loveliness. A queen in opal or in ruby dress. A nameless girl in freshest summer greens. A saint, an angel. Every canvas means the same one meaning, neither more nor less. He feeds upon her face by day and night. And she with true kind eyes looks back on him, fair as the moon and joyful as the light. Not one with waiting, nor with sorrow dim. Not as she is, but was when hope shone bright. Not as she is, but as she fills his dream. I think this is just an utterly marvellous poem about um, the construction of um, women and, and women's appearance and women's beauty in art um, set against the reality of, of women's experience and women's, um, yeah, I guess the, 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 the living of that life of being the artist model um, being so different to the actual um, the being that we see represented in art. So if you can remember that um, image of Ophelia that we've just seen, and I don't know if you can remember the picture that I showed you uh, yesterday, um, I wanted to show you in contrast Elizabeth Siddle's own portrait of herself, um, which is much more in keeping with Christina Rossetti's poem than it is with the other um, works of art showing her face. I think there is this image time and time again if you go and see pre-raphaelite works of art um you will just see this red-headed lady everywhere and not all of them are lizzie siddle they had a couple of different models they really had a big thing for big red hair and you know luscious lips and stuff like that um but they this this image of like a a kind of a beautiful but maybe slightly despairing um pale skinned stunning woman um is there time and again and it's it's so interesting that it is so different from the way that she painted herself looking almost quite um sickly and unhappy but not in a romantic sense um in th that picture and how she's presented in this poem uh, there's a lot of features of this poem that I particularly like um I like this idea that she, um, the, the idea, we found her hidden just behind those screens, um, to me almost immediately set up almost like an idea of a mystery or indeed even a murder. Um, and it's not a truthful murder. They're not actually saying that Lizzie Siddle was, was killed by this experience or that the, the um, fictional model of the poem was, was killed by the experience of being an artist model. Um, but I think the implication is that, that something was being sapped out of her, something that couldn't be um, regrown. Like every time she sat um, for this painting and was presented as this idealised image, um, something was taken from her and the, that is strengthened by the line later on, he feeds upon her face by day and night. Um, which has got two sides to it. Firstly, he's in this room surrounded by pictures of her face, like it's the only thing he sees, it's the only thing he takes in, it's his only source of inspiration. Um, and also the idea that in doing so, he is taking something away from her. Um, and that the woman herself is, is shrinking and becoming less and becoming this um, one with waiting, sorrow dim, character that is more like the picture that you can see um, in Lizzie's own self-portrait. 
just that like the, the deification of this the, this woman the the saint the angel um as it says in the poem that he's trying to create the the queen in opal and ruby dress um making her so much more than she is um but also taking away from who she is so the line that I found particularly apt was a nameless girl and I found that particularly apt because I have been looking for pictures of Lizzie Siddle to show you and sometimes it's quite hard to find out um who was the model in in certain pictures and you have like one website will say oh yeah this is a definitely a picture of this model and another website will say oh I think it's it's this model instead and it can be um it's almost like this this image was so central to their work and so central to what they presented um, to the world of their brotherhood, um, but she's not counted within it. It's not a sisterhood. Um, although there is a website called the Pre-Raphaelite Sisterhood. Um, and she's not, in many ways, she's not acknowledged. And when I said it implies there's almost like a murder, uh, we talked yesterday, well, I talked yesterday about the fact that Lizzie Siddle um, died in a way that was possibly uh, linked to her potentially dissatisfactory uh, life, um, I suppose. Um, there's all sorts of accusations thrown around, like that she became ill because she posed in a bath as Ophelia, that kind of thing. It's just rumours and myths and so on. Um, this poem was written long before she died, so it's, it wasn't any direct reference to that, but it wasn't published until 1896, so it wasn't published until after Christina Rossetti's death, um, along with apparently a selection of other poems that were quite critical of the pre-Raphaelite brother, brotherhood and the um, methods and approaches that they used. I believe that Christina was a lot more religious, um, according to what it says in here, excuse me, a lot more religious than her brother and maybe a lot more religious than the other members of the Brotherhood. She also had an active interest in working with, um, such a classic Victorian term, fallen women. Um, she worked for many years apparently with fallen women at the Highgate Penitentiary. Um, so she had an interest in um, uh, women who had um, perhaps lived unconventional lives, who had maybe fallen on harder times. Um, and I think that comes through in the poem, this idea that she has a sympathy for this woman that is seen as something other than what she is um, in the eyes of the artist. Um, yeah, um, so I enjoyed this poem. I really, I really did. I'm going to read it again for you. This has turned out to be a shorter um, video than some of the others. I think because it's quite a short poem and once you've captured that, initial idea there's I, I, I mean it, it kind of it says what it says and it is very critical of the thing that it criticizes which is the, the handling of the woman by the artist um but I guess there's not so much underneath that I don't know um I should say it is a sonnet um it does um abide by the normal sonnet rhyming scheme and when you count the syllables in the line it does do the normal da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, but it tends not to what I mean is it, it's iambic pent pentameter, but it's not necessarily in the da dum da dum da dum. It's it, it bends according to what is the meaning of the, sen the of the line, which um, I think it does quite well. Um, I like the flexibility of the rhythm a bit. Like yesterday, we were talking about saying almost exactly the same thing. Um, I kind of wonder actually, like how much of their craft the two Rossetti poets kind of learnt together. Um, obviously, they grew up in a very a literary circle where they were, were each learning from their parents who were quite literary and from the people that they knew. Um, but in almost in style, I feel like I can see similarities between the, the siblings' poems, um, but I don't know whether that's because I know that they're siblings and I know that they're writing maybe along similar themes, although taking very different approaches to those themes. So yeah, I'll read it again. One face looks out from all his canvases. One self-same figure sits or walks or leans. We found her, hidden, just behind those screens. That mirror gave back all her loveliness. A queen in opal or in ruby dress. A nameless girl in freshest summer greens. A saint. An angel. Every canvas means the same one meaning, neither more nor less. He feeds upon her face by day and night, and she with true kind eyes looks back on him, fair as the moon and joyful as the light, not wan with waiting, not with sorrow dim, not as she is but was when hope shone bright, not as she is, but as she fills his dream. There's almost something quite critical in there about the single-mindedness of the artist. Um, 
it's almost like the way that she says um, that same one meaning, neither more nor less, it's kind of like she is saying of her brother or of the other um, artists in the group, like, why aren't you pushing this any further? Why are you always reverting to the same um, image and the same theme? Like, why why don't you take your art um, and, and take it deeper or explore different avenues? Um, so I like that she's quite harsh with them about that. Um, and you get that through the repetition that she uses within the poem, like she repeats one face, one figure, um, canvases is repeated, um, meaning is repeated, um, and by doing that she kind of hammers home the point that of how restricted the artist is in contrast to the woman, and you feel like um, the woman, although it isn't, it may not appear in the paintings, the woman is the one with greater depth here, um, because she's the one that's able to experience hope shining bright and so on, uh, rather than being limited to just what's on the, the image that's on the page. Um, but she's the one that suffers from the artist's single-mindedness. So yeah. Um, so what I've been doing up to now is I've been um, putting the full text of the poem in the description. I'm not going to be able to do that because my laptop is... Um, I'm not going to say it's deceased because we've got some technical minds here who are hard at work figuring out how we're going to get it to work again um, but it, it's not working very well so once I posted the video from my phone um, I normally go back into my laptop to be able to um, like edit the description and stuff and I've been linking the Victober hosts and stuff like that um, but I I can't, <laughs> I can't I can't do that because my laptop is currently in Four or five different pieces um just over there actually <laughs> um and a little heap of heap of screws um so hopefully by next week i will be able to go back in and add but what i found is that you can normally find the full text of these poems um from like the the poetry foundation if you just search for the um author and the um title of the poem um i will if i can type it out on my phone i will do um because this one's quite a short one Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Oh yeah, and once I posted it from my phone, for some reason I can't go back and then edit it on my phone. It's... It, I don't know. I don't understand it. Um, so anyway, I hope you've un enjoyed that poem. It's it's an interesting... Like, it's not really a poem to enjoy because it's so um, cutting. Um, but it's definitely an interesting poem in terms of, like, the theme of the position of women and I guess if you compare it back to some of the other poems particularly the poems that we've had that have been written by women so we had Elizabeth Barrett Browning um writing about again a silent woman in art so um the image of the slave girl and using that um idealized and beautified image of um a woman there to make a political argument um we've also had Adelaide Ann Proctor um, and this idea of a woman forced to um, remain at home and have her hopes suppressed and lose the um, meaning and fulfilment in her life because her her lover is the one who who gets to explore those elements of his personality. So it kind of fits into that pattern of um, works about women in the Victorian time questioning the role and the position of women and the treatment of women by men. Um, during that period. So that's an interesting thing to see developing over the course of the um, over the course of October, I suppose, <laughs> over the course of the Victorian period as well, I guess. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. Um, I hope you found that one interesting, I will say, and I will see you tomorrow where we will be reading a poem by James Johnson, if he's got a short poem, which he possibly does not. Or if not, we're skipping James Johnson and going straight on to another pre-Raphaelite guy and we've got William Morris. So we shall see. I look forward to speaking to you tomorrow. Take care.